that's a bad opening. And I'm not just being hard on myself. I'll tell you why that's a bad opening. Have you ever said something with absolute certainty and then changed your mind? Yeah. I'm here to eat my words because last year I said this, but I've written a book really, really quickly and then just never wanted to look at it again. I also said this, and I've never looked at it again and I can't see a point in the future where I'm ever gonna read it again. However, last week I made a video where I discovered the value in reading back your own work and trying to appreciate what you've written previously, a lifetime ago. So, with this draft that I've kept on my hard drive for almost two years now, I thought, why not read it back? Figure out, even if it's terrible, something that I can take away from it. So, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna read the opening chapter back and see if it is in fact as bad as I remember it. Should probably tell you what the book was supposed to be all about first though, so yeah. It's kind of a retro futuristic sci-fi story set in a rainy beachside city and like most stuff I write, it has an attempted literary edge to it. The premise at the very beginning of the story is that the malcontent main character is having problems after some experimental memory alteration therapy he's just had. Essentially, he can still remember all the things that he wanted to forget. I wanted the book to be clever and to pack an emotional punch. I had the ending planned out from the word go. There were so many things I wanted it to be. The working title was Retrograde Radio. But three months after I started it, when it was finished, it felt like a failure. All right, so I wrote this book really quickly, in like three months, and that's quicker than I've ever written a book before, and this was the first one I ever planned, scene by scene, the whole way through. Didn't care too much for the process, I'll be honest. This first draft is essentially what put me off writing novels, at least for the time being. So this should be fun. All right, let's open it up. First impressions. Really glad I put the time and energy into making a cool logo for the book instead of, you know, taking more time over it and making it a better book. We all know what's really important and it's definitely cool logos. There's the title, WT, it's a working title. Haven't quite settled on that, but settled enough to make a logo about it, apparently. Okay, I'm stalling. What's the first line? Let's, chapter one, Jerry. Jerry's my main character, I've got two. First line. What a terrible mistake this might have been. The worst of it was, he thought, if it all went to plan, he'd never know. Jesus. That's a bad opening. And I'm not just being hard on myself. I'll tell you why that's a bad opening. What a terrible mistake this might have been. I, th I remember thinking, that's a really good hook. It's a good hook because people give like, what's a mistake? What's he done? But. The rest of the sentence is, well, the rest of the first line thing, first tiny micro paragraph, is really confusing. The worst of it was, he thought, if all went to plan, he'd never know. He'd never know what? What I mean is he'd never know if it was a mistake. And I'm trying to play on the whole uh, memory removal thing, right? So he won't remember if any of this is a mistake. But it just doesn't, it just doesn't make sense. You're left thinking, shall I read that again? Considering the premise of the story, I think a better opening would have just been he was remembering things he shouldn't have remembered or the memories were still there or, you know, anything like that that would give a stronger indication of what this story is actually going to be about. Because I talked about opening lines in my past video somewhere about how your opening line really, if you can make it sum up the theme or the feeling of your book in some way or another, then that's a really good way to start out. It's a good way to set up the reader's expectations and let them know what kind of story they're in for. So, not off to a great start. Don't love the first line. Where did I go from there? I'll read the whole paragraph. What a treat. Jerry Munro Keller stood in his attic bedroom in front of the open arched window like a gargoyle, waiting for the rain to smooth down his rough edges. How atmospheric. In front of him, the sleeping city of St. Anthony lay flat out along the shoreline, as though it had travelled a great distance to the sea and then given up the ghost. Okay. I like the second half of that, but a bugbear for me and something that I see in a lot of books and is truly 
okay and absolutely fine is saying your main character's full name really early on in the book. It's like, right, better let them know who they are. Here's his, you know, ID card or whatever. I just don't like that. I don't like it when I come across it in something I'm reading and I try really hard not to write it myself. So I don't really know why I did. The way he stood in his attic bedroom in front of the open arched window like a gargoyle, it's a great setup. If the character was a villain, which he isn't, the reader is actually supposed to be quite sympathetic with Jerry throughout this whole story, so that's not great. His character is kind of, he's kind of like a, a malcontent sort of character. Aging, radio DJ, think like a chubbier Mark Maron. That's kind of what I was going for. This, um, this sets up someone that you're not going to empathise with, I dare say. But I like the second half of the paragraph, like I said. That this, this second half, not bad. That's alright. I, I, it's still a bit flowery, but I was trying to set the scene. I was going for this retro-futuristic city by the, by the beach, so... Yeah, okay. Whatever. Okay, so some dialogue now. House, call Aptas again, Jerry said. So, you don't know that's AI, obviously, but I'm about to explain that, so fine. Most AIs came with a default name. Since his was a whole house system, that was its name. House, I guess. He'd been to many homes of friends to find they'd all named theirs. Archimedes, Hawkins, Parks, Nightingale. He'd hear him call out, Hawkins, dim the lights a little. And he'd have to close his eyes just a little bit to ease the irritation. The engineer who installed House had waited for, with bated breaths for Jerry to come up with a name, as though he was used to this being everybody's favourite moment. He seemed surprised and disappointed when Jerry had told him the default was fine. So, I was trying to go for characterization on Jerry with this, I think. I was trying to make him seem like he, he was rejecting the future. He's something of a Luddite in this story, in terms of technology and artificial intelligence. What I've actually done with this sentence is just alienate anybody who has a digital home assistant in their house at this point. It's a good good little way to make me look like I'm holier than thou compared to everybody else who uses those things. Let's move on. Through House's audio output, a small speaker in every room of his three-story townhouse, Jerry listened to the phone ring. He counted 11 rings before it connected. Okay. Again, I'm kind of shoehorning in the setting. Here's where he lives. It's a three-story townhouse. It's more setting than I'm used to putting into my writing, especially in short fiction. I never do that. But because you're going to need to know about this house for the rest of the book, I guess I've doubled down on it a little bit. Good evening and welcome to Optas. Please wait while we connect you to a representative. So Optas are this fake medical company. Well, they're not fake in the, in the book. They're fake because I made them up, but so is literally everything I've ever written. They're, they're a company that offer this memory alteration treatment. So say you've got some kind of past trauma or something bad happened to you that you want to forget about. You go to Optas and they, you know, zap you in some way and it gets rid of the memory completely. Um, this is kind of what the story hinges around, the ability to choose to do that and whether or not you really want to do that or not. Sounds a bit like one of Charlie Brooker's rejected ideas for a Black Mirror episode, but I, I like the concept. I still like the concept, but it's probably just a bit overdone. So anyway, there was music that sounded to Jerry like digital breathing, rising and falling in subtle beeps and hums. Outside the rain was picking up. He could see all the way over to the beach from his place, steady lights out to sea. He wondered if the same rain was falling on them, if there might be a person standing against the railings of some vessel, seasick, or getting some fresh air, staring back at St. Anthony. Seeing him, but not really. So this feels pretty moody to me and a little bit self-indulgent, to be honest. I'm kind of laying it on pretty thick. Standing over the city to the north, the mountains began, and Jerry could see another light, this one red and blinking, the radio station where a show was due to start in just under an hour. Again, with this shoehorning in information, this this page, so has it just been the one page? It feels like a lot more. Just the one page, there's so much info dumping going on. I mean, I, I've tried to wrap it up. I've tried to hide it a little bit, but it's, it's info dumping. I've told you the main character's name, where he lives, where he works, and I've tried to characterize him as a brooding kind of dude, all in one page. It's a lot of information to shoehorn in. Seems like at least we're headed back into the conversation now, so we might forward the plot a little bit. So, good evening, Mr. Monroe Keller. My name's Dalton. How may I assist you this evening? 
I know why I said evening really weird then. Jerry jumped at the sudden perfect voice, then rolled his eyes. Again, really doesn't like AI. Are you getting the message? For God's sake, are you human? My name is Dalton. I'm a member of Optas Overnight Call Operating Team. Miss an apostrophe there. I am qualified to answer any query you may have and would love the opportunity to AI robot again. Yeah, this point again. Look, d he'd been about to call it Dalton. He was slipping, call it Dalton. Really focusing on that AI aren't people thing in case anybody hadn't realized that. He was slipping. This whole week, he hadn't felt like himself. Optas had told him there'd be side effects from the treatment. Sleeplessness, confusion, restlessness, but not like this. They said nothing about flashbacks. Now here he was in the dead of night talking to a robot like it would understand him. Finally getting into some plot. He's been getting flashbacks. Memories are coming back to him that they shouldn't have. This should be way further up. This should be the opening paragraph. Maybe with a little bit of the scene setting and atmosphere that I, there was in the first couple of paragraphs, mix some of that into it and make it one thing and start with this. That's what I need to do. Well, that's what I would need to do if I intended to do anything with this. Look, AI machine, give him a message for me, will you? I'm sorry, who may I give a message? Jerry took a breath. This was the third call he'd made, though the other two had been during the day when actual people still answered the phone. Okay, boomer. He'd spoken to a guy who sounded like he was talking through a paper cup and kept saying, hmm? And a woman who'd seemed generally disturbed by his... Generally? Genuinely, I think I mean genuinely there. Neither of the calls seemed to take him anywhere. Your boss, that's who I want. The head honcho, the big cheese, the chief operating... Marcus Neuer. Okay, the antagonist. Marcus Neuer is the head of Optas. He is the genius memory alteration treatment guy. Thank you. Dr. Neuer is unavailable at the moment. May I take a message? Question mark. I can forward it to his office for you. The AI spoke with perfect politeness and it was getting under Jerry's skin. Yeah, I think I might have mentioned that once or twice. Please, that's what I asked you. Jerry took another breath. Yes, I'd like to leave. Oh, that was supposed to be exasperated. Um, so probably the ellipsis here wasn't what I want. I probably want one of those. Probably want a little hyphen or something. Or I probably want to do that, maybe. And then if he's taking a breath, I'm indicating a pause. So I'll put it on a separate line to slow things down a little bit. Yes, I'd like to leave a message for Marcus Neuer. All right. Oops, scrolling all over the place. All right, I'll listen to you message. All right, I'll listen to your message and save it to our systems. When you're ready to begin, just start talking. I'll be able to tell when you've finished. Go right ahead, Jerry. AI is kind of annoying now. I'll give, I'll give Jerry that. The f thing called me Jerry, he said out loud. What a way to start the message. He shook himself and changed his tone. Shook himself. Like a dog getting out of the water. Noya, it's Munro Keller again. This is my third time calling now and you're not responding. You never told me about these flashes, flashbacks, whatever the f*** they are. They weren't part of the idyllic future happiness I was supposed to be heading to. The one you promised me. This isn't momentary confusion or restlessness or f hemorrhoids or God knows what other side effects. This is not right, I'm telling you. You made a mistake somewhere. I'm remembering things, at least I think I am. You told me that wouldn't happen. I don't want to be an asshole here, but I want this fixed soon. Not good enough. Call me back. Okay, why is this not further up? I mean, it's it's a bit full on. The hemorrhoid thing is probably a little out of place, but the rest of it is okay. I, I should have pulled this further up and started with it. He waited a moment in silence, feeling a little stupid. Yeah, all right, well, at least I acknowledge then that that was a little bit over the top. Fair enough. Thank you, Jerry, the AI said. As I detected profanities in your message, for your convenience and the convenience of Optas staff, I've taken the liberty of censoring your message. In future, Optas would like to request that you refrain from, are you going to give him the message or not? Jerry blurted out. Such language as it may be offensive to members of our staff. <laughs> thank you for our, thank you for your consideration. I will forward your message to the to the office of Dr. Marcus Neuer. Is there anything else I can do for you? No, Jerry said. The rain was starting to make him shiver. That conversation's okay. I like that the AI is being so petty and particular about his language. It's making him seem like a fish out of water. Further in characterization, it's what I was going for. I'm trying to make him a malcontent. I'm okay with that. Um, 
but the last bit, the rain was starting to make him shiver. Close the windows then, it's your house. All right, then from all of us at Optas, we wish you a pleasant evening. Thank you for calling. Thanks. Why did he say thanks if he hates AI so much and the conversation's over? Just hung up, that doesn't really make too much sense. House ended the call, seeing Jerry's wave of the hand, catching the gesture, even though Jerry stood in darkness. So I need some explanation there that like the house is, I don't know, got some sort of system that monitors gestures and that kind of thing. Just because otherwise it's like, what? He held his wrist up, turning it in a sliver of moonlight again. I think I've got enough atmosphere to be getting on with. They'd given him a wristband to wear for seven days. It was similar to a hospital ID band, several layers of paper glued together to make something not quite strong enough to survive being caught on a door handle or a seatbelt. Not that he was supposed to be driving yet. He was, of course. He saw nothing wrong with his physical body, no reason why he couldn't be mobile. But his mind, that was the troubling part. Okay, I like this paragraph. Because, other than, like, I don't know how many years this is supposed to be into the future, maybe like a century or less than that, but would they really still be gluing paper bands to people's arms? Probably not. What I like about this is kind of a smooth transition because I'd said that the paper wasn't strong enough to survive being caught in a door handle or a seatbelt, and then I kind of edged that into talking about the after treatment kind of situation where he's not supposed to be driving, and then I edged in a bit of characterization there by saying he was still driving though, blah, blah, blah. His mind was a troubling part. That was an effective paragraph. I got a lot into that in a way that I think was pretty smooth. On one side, the side he wore outwards on the top of his wrist, the band said, please be patient with me. I've just had MAT, which is mind alter, mind, memory alteration treatment. That's what that is. On the other side, the one he kept face down to himself in smaller print, it said, trust your decision. You do not want to remember. There was a telephone number there for emergencies, the number he'd already called three times. Mm -hmm. Trust your decision. You do not want to remember. That needs to be in rephrased to a slightly more original, but something to that effect needs to be in earlier in the story, even before the chapter begins or something. This could all be condensed into a much shorter period of time. So how did I finish this initial chapter? Trust your decision. He shook his head. The rain was still coming in and Jerry, no still coming in, closed the window. And Jerry noticed the ledge in front of him was starting to drip down onto the carpet. Definitely closed the window. He wrenched the window closed, there you go, and looked towards the radio station on the mountain. If he could get through just one broadcast without any weird flashes of memory, any odd visions, maybe he'd feel better. Whatever the case, Noya needed to call him back. One more day and Jerry might just spill his guts all over the radio, see if that got the good doctor's attention. Okay, setting up a protagonist, antagonist thing, letting you know all about my main character. I did a good job on this, this opening chapter thing, I guess, but I overdid it. It's overwritten, it's a little bit too long, and it's too atmospheric and a little bit too edgy. So other than that though, not terrible, but that right there is the chapter that I spent the most time on. So, I don't know what the rest of it would be like. However, just like last week's video where I said it's always useful to go back and look at old work and see what you like about it or what you don't like about it and have things just occur to you that make you glad to have written something. I do feel better about the project or about the draft just from having read that. So I think it was a fun activity in analyzing your own writing when it's so long ago that it doesn't feel like your own writing anymore. Uh, I might do a bit more of it in the future, I might not. Let me know if you enjoyed this video or if you wanna see more stuff like this. If you want to know more about me or my writing, you can visit my website, links in the description. As always, thanks so much for watching. Happy writing.